Welcome, welcome. Hi. I see some familiar faces today. <laughs> hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Fur and Feathers Stand Together, an Earth Day celebration with Contra Costa County Library. We're so glad that you could join us today. My name is Katie, and I am one of the librarians at El Cerrito Library. With me today, we also have Julia and Amy from Contra Costa Library. Hello, guys. <laughs> And also we have our friend, David Griswold. <laughs> he is here to do a reading of his new book, Fur and Feathers Stand Together, which is a tale of two unlikely friends, a puffin and a polar bear, joining together with their community to save the ice that's melting around them. After the story time, Dave will share some fun activities and challenges all about climate change and how we can do our part to help the environment as well. Before we start today, I wanted to mention a couple of things. We will be recording this program and posting it to the YouTube and Facebook pages for Contra Costa County Library for a limited amount of time. If you guys have any questions or comments for David during the program, feel free to use that chat box, send those over to us, and we will bring it up during the Q&A at the end of the program. Uh, but until then, we ask all participants to please stay muted so we can all enjoy David's story together. But for now, Take it away, David. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, El Cerrito Library. Mm -hmm. And thank you everybody who is sharing part of your Earth Day with us. Oh my gosh, I'm just so excited to get to connect with you and to share this book that I wrote that for me, this, this story that I'm gonna read, Fur and Feather Stand Together, was really my answer to the question, what can I do about climate change? that leverages who I am, what I love, and what I really hope to offer. And, and so I'm a children's book author and an educator. And so for me, that answer was a picture book. And because when I looked around, right, I didn't see that many picture books about climate change. It's kind of a big, potentially scary topic. And I was, I was really interested in how can I, how can I write a book that tells the story of climate change because it looks like so many different things, um, but also tell in a way that hopefully leaves all of you feeling, you know, inspired and empowered. You know, the feeling like we're in this together and there is a brighter future that we can create together. So that was some of the, the, the reason why I wrote this. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to share it with you. I do like to usually share with folks um, before I start. It's really important for me to name that, that I could not have made this book without a ton of help. I mean, there were so many people. Um, I feel like even probably Katie and Julia from the library at some point, I'm sure, I think I had shared a draft with Julia. She gave me some feedback. I also had the chance to collaborate with the head of climate science at the Center for Biological Diversity, who gave us like a scientific perspective. And then another thing that was really important to the book, you'll notice there's a main character here, the main human character. Her name is CQ. And for me and for my illustrator, Eliza, who's a good friend of mine, it felt really important to us that our main character was a young indigenous woman. Because for us, you know, we're huge fans of Greta Thunberg. Right, she's kind of uh, one of the folks we think of when we think of like climate leaders, uh, young climate leaders. But there's been a lot of uh, people of color, a lot of indigenous women um, who have been on the front lines fighting these fights for a long time. And they don't always get the sort of spotlight and coverage. And so it felt important to us as a, you know, as a white author and a white illustrator um, to make sure that our book featured a diverse array of people, but specifically spotlighted, you know, the work that, and, and also the way that unfortunately, right, climate change does disproportionately impact, you know, low-income communities and communities of color. Um, to make sure, right, I'm, as a white author, this, it's not my cultural background. The only way that it felt really genuine to do that was I got to connect with a really amazing group called the International Indigenous Youth Council. And I got to speak with them and this incredible person named Sigun, who is from Alaska. And that was where we envisioned our character coming from. And she really, you know, talked it through with us and made sure that we could feature 
a young indigenous woman as our main character in a way that that really kind of felt again genuine and and um, reflective of like the traditions of where she comes from. Um, so I just like to name that. You know, it's it, this book. I think sometimes, right, when when you read a, a children's book, it's like whoa, just drops down out of the sky. Like the author must have just thought it up and made it. Um, but I could not have made this without a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, I am so excited to get to share it with y'all. Again, thank you for being here. Um, and like Katie said, after the book, uh, I'll kind of share a couple of hopefully fun ways that, that you can engage and, and take some next steps. And then my favorite part of all this is I want to hear from you. I want to hear your questions, thoughts, all that good stuff. Um, are y'all ready for this story? You can go, woo woo. All right. <laughs> nice. I see some thumbs up. There we go. Woo woo. I'm going to share my screen. We'll, we'll do the ebook here because that's a nice, clean, clean, crisp edition. Can you all see? Oh, wait, am I sharing the right screen? Can you see the book? Okay, perfect. All right, this is Fur and Feather Stand Together. And if you want, I know sometimes the my screen like can cover up the book. It, on Zoom, if you click the little minimize thing at the top of the video, so it looks like a little horizontal bar, you can shrink uh, the video so you only see the book. Totally up to you. Just a little cool Zoom pro tip. All right, here we go. Fur and feather stand together. Up in the north on a sun-filled day that should have been so cool, a little puffin, Penny P, got dressed and left for school. But as she zipped, well, thunk, she tripped. How odd, a crack out here? And stranger still, she saw a bear alone at sea in tears. <laughs> Help me please, the white bear wailed. The ice, it's getting thin. I've lost my mom, my home, and worse, I never learned to swim. <laughs> now, birds and bears are hardly friends. But Penny heard his plea, and with the strength of 30 birds, she saved him from the sea. The bear bent down and kissed her claws and said, oh, thank you kindly. My name is Nook, and I was sure that no one here would find me. Call me Penny, said Penny P, and Nook, you've got me thinking that you and I should find a way to stop this ice from shrinking. So off they dashed to Penny's school where class was still on track. We need your help, they told her friends, to bring our winter back. They pulled a map and pinned up stars on spots to spread the word. But soon they found these warmer days hurt more than bear and bird. So on this next page, maybe you'll notice some of the different ways animals in different places are affected by climate change. Because again, it looks different depending on where you are, but it's all united by one common thing. In dripping jungles, soggy sloths complained of heavy rains. In dry savannas, zebras cried, the sun has scorched our plains. Among the trees, koalas hid as fires lit the skies, while Bengal tigers told of floods with terror in their eyes. Across the world, the stories changed, but one truth flowed like water. As human beings kept taking more. And maybe you notice on this page, this page really shows some of the different things that humans do. And sometimes it's just part of the way that we live our lives, right? We need trees and other, other resources from the earth to do the things that we love to do. But those things can, can have an impact, especially given that there's millions of us, right? So on this page, maybe you can notice some of the things that we do that contribute to climate change. As human beings kept taking more, and for me, uh, just one last thought on this page, right? I think part of the trick with climate change is when we take more, 
more than we maybe need. As human beings kept taking more, the earth kept getting hotter. So as we know, right, climate change doesn't just impact animals, it also impacts people. But it's also something people can work together on. And that's what the next pages are about. Nook and Penny shared their tale from sea to rising sea. They spoke with woe of melting snow to folks like you and me. When no one stopped, they chose a spot and wouldn't be moved off it till those in charge put birds and bears before their greed and profit. And then an ant crawled up to Nook and whispered in his ear, we heard about your melting ice and brought our families here. Then next to Penny plopped a frog who told her with a croak, we came as quick as we could hop to join you noble folk. Soon others came, baboons and loons and elephants and mice. The ravens cod these warmer days do more than just melt ice. They strengthen storms, they deepen droughts, they gobble up our coast. It's those on earth, the least to blame, who feel the heat the most. And more and more their crowd grew strong while mostly people hid, except for CQ, bold and brave, a wise and wondrous kid, who said to Nook, I'll stand with you, until we change some hearts. Cause small or not, we won't be stopped if we all play our parts. And with those words, she took Nook's paw and reached for Penny's flipper. Across the lawn, they linked their limbs with fins and wings and grippers. And usually my daughter interrupts me at this point and says, dad, what are grippers? And then I have to explain, they're just things that hold on to other things. And it's a great rhyme with flipper, right? Hopefully. And hand to hoof, from foot to tail, they reached across the land. And when they hit the ocean's edge, crustaceans joined the band. And what I like to do on this page, if you're at home and if you're sitting next to somebody and you feel comfortable doing it, I really like to invite you Maybe hold hands with somebody next to you and imagine that you are a part of this chain. I actually just read this book this morning to my old high school in Maine on the other side of the country. And we imagined a chain going from coast to coast, from California to Maine. And if you aren't with somebody right now, maybe close your eyes and imagine that you are connected to all these other people all these other beings that are working to make the world a better place. From clam to claw, from ship to shell, from barnacle to whale, the chain kept growing round the globe, for all had heard the tale. Of melting ice and rising tides, they heard the planet's call. From deserts dry to mountains high, the climate touched them all. And for a moment, the whole world paused. Until, without direction, and if you're holding hands with that person next to you or closing your eyes, I'm gonna send each of you right now a squeeze. A squeeze was passed from hand to paw, completing their connection. In all who felt it, something grew, a thing not big at first, a simple feeling all were one that could not be reversed. 
Her penny, nook and seek you too, their work had just begun. And this may be one of the most important lines of the book. And key to changing hearts and minds was having lots of fun. They spread the word, their simple truth, no matter fur or feather. To change the climate for the good, we have to stand together. Whew, that was fur and feather. I got some tingles. I feel like I, I felt the squeeze coming from all of you. I don't know if you felt it, but whew, man, we, I, I feel connected. Um, wow. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for letting me share that story with you. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, Katie and Julia will follow up with a couple of, of links. But essentially, there's two things that I like to, to kind of offer um, that folks can consider doing as like next steps after hearing the story. Um, the first is, right, this book for me, when I think about like, when I think about what we can do about climate change, for me, so much of whatever we do comes back to connection. Nobody's gonna solve this on their own. And you, I'm sure if you're here tuning in for Earth Day, you're probably already caring about the planet, probably already taking action. And you need to know you're not alone. And so one thing that we like to invite people to do to help make more connections in the world is to join our kindness challenge. And I know that might seem strange, right? Like how does kindness connect to climate? Well, you know, I'm a poet, so I'm always looking for connections, but I genuinely feel like kindness is a powerful way of connecting with others around us. And so our kindness challenge actually has two parts if you're up for it. One is doing an act of kindness for a person. And the second is doing an act of kindness for a plant or animal. Because for me, if we are, it's not just about connecting with each other, that's really important, but we need to reconnect in the, in the ways that we can with the, the, the more than human world, right? Because we share this planet with more than just humans and we depend on more than just humans. So that's one thing. Um, if you wanna join our ki kindness challenge, that would be so awesome. Um, we love to have people join and then share their stories. And if you do, Here's a super cool thing. You will get a digital copy of Fur and Feather. So that thing that I just read, I will send you a copy and it's yours uh, to keep and share and do with as you please. Um, the second thing, and this is a little more creative and fun, is we have developed some Fur and Feather sequel templates. A sequel, right, is a story that comes after a story. And for me, right, it's like, hopefully this book is just the beginning and I want to know what your ideas are for what comes next, right? Like, what's the actions that we got to take? What are the ways that we take care of the planet? There's an opportunity for you to share and that could be using those templates or I I've had people send me poems. I've had people send me like pictures and videos, whatever it is, whatever you're inspired to do, know that uh, I'm, I'm always just so excited when people take that next step. So. Katie and Julia will follow up with some, some links to those things. But I think we're at the part now. I want to turn it over to you. I want to hear from all of you, like what your questions are. And that could be about climate change. It could be about Earth Day. It could be about writing and books. I would, I would love to, to know what I can share with all of you. Oh, and I just saw Amy. Thank you for that. They're very kind words. And Camille for your agreement. <laughs> um, I think I, I kind of saw somebody raise their hand. What I would say is feel free to, um, or Katie, did you want to jump in? Yeah, if you guys raise your hands, I will go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. It looks like Camille has a question first, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. Okay, so I um, I have a question, or that's kind of like I said that already. It's um, about the, how long did it take to write that book? Oh my gosh, Camille, thank you for your question. It's a complicated answer. How long did it take to, to write this book? Um, so I had the idea maybe like five or six years ago. And I would say it probably took me maybe a couple of weeks to write like the first draft. 
But then it took about five years until it became a book. And I know I see your eyes go wide, like, oh my gosh, that's a long time. Um, now, it's important to know I did not work on it every day for five years. That'd be, that'd be a lot. Um, but, right, part of what I mentioned before, so much of what has made this book so fun and, and why I love being an author is the chance to connect with people, right? Like, so I got to connect with Sigun and the International Indigenous Youth Council. I got to connect with the Center for Biological Diversity. I've gotten to connect with so many different people and groups. And that meant that it took longer to write the book. But there are things that came up in the story that just never would have emerged if I hadn't taken the time and hadn't connected with those people. Um, like a funny story, um, just real quick. And then I saw some other people raise their hand. Penny P, the puffin, used to be a penguin. You believe that's, it seems like, oh, that makes sense, right? But then the scientist that I talked to, does anybody know why um, we, we had to change from a penguin to a puffin? Does anybody want to take a guess? Go for it, Camille. I was like, do you know it's because penguins um, don't live in Antarctica? And penguins don't live in the same place as polar bears. Yeah. Ugh. Now, you know, I was going to make an argument that like climate change is leading to animals getting displaced from their natural habitats. But given that they live on opposite ends of the planet, it still seemed like too much of a stretch. And fortunately, the word puffin also starts with a P and is two syllables, which worked for the poetry. So things like that, Camille, right? Like if, if I hadn't taken as long, if I hadn't asked a bunch of questions, um, you know, we might have had a book that that scientists would have raised a big eyebrow at. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it would have been, I agree that it would have been like, it wouldn't have made it as good of a book as if you actually knew about how penguins and polar bears live on the opposite side of the world, then it would be like, well, why does why does why is the book like that? So yeah, it would, it's definitely better with puffin. Wow, Camille, you just made my day. I'm so glad we made the change because I've I've gone back and forth on it, and now I know we made the right choice. Thank you so much. All right, I think I saw, and feel free if you have other questions. But I think I saw some uh, maybe one other person raising their hand or. It looked like before Ansel and Stanley had raised their hand. Do you guys still want to uh, ask a question? Um, somebody else already asked it. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, cool. I have a question. <laughs> yes. Have you written any other books other than Fur and Oh Fire? my gosh, Katie. <laughs> That's such a kind question to ask. Um, yes, I've, I've written, I've written a bunch of things. Um, most recently, what I'm really most excited about is I write a lot of poems that are kind of like um, Shel Silverstein. Raise, raise your. I can, I can only see Camille, but Camille, have you heard heard of Shel Silverstein? You've heard, yeah. Uh, do you like Shel Silverstein? When I see, uh, it looks like somebody else raised their hand. Awesome. So I've written a lot of poems that are kind of like Shel Silverstein because I grew up loving Shel Silverstein. Do you all want to hear a silly poem that's in the style of Shel Silverstein? I'm seeing some nodding heads. Here we go. Here we go. All right. This this is a poem yeah. I wrote. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Stan, you said yes, uh, Ansel and Stanley? Yes. Okay. Re here we go. Here we go. It's poetry month. I didn't even know that. Here we go. Perfect. This poem is called Black Boot Bill. Black Boot Bill was fierce and mean, and how he loved his plank. He'd push you off, no reason at all, and laugh there as you sank. His boots were black, his beard was forked, his foes were all unlucky. The most fearsome pirate to sail the seas, atop a rubber ducky. Huh? Yeah, see a little twist, right? Very much like Shel Silverstein. Um, so there's there's others of those. I'm, oh, wow, that, that got a round of applause. This is good. This is good. Um, so yes, I've written I've written things like that and, and also some other books. Um, as well that that um, are sort of previously published and hopefully forthcoming. <laughs> I see some hands though. Let's keep going with the questions. Thank you so much for that. It looks like uh, Kaja. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Here you go. You can ask a question. It's okay. Many people get this one. 
I'm not blaming you, but my <gasps> name is Kaisa because it's Swedish. Oh, very nice. Hi, Kaisa. Hi. And my question is, is did you get more than one publisher to publish your books? Ooh, excellent question. Um, so this book, we chose to do something called self-publishing, which is kind of amazing. You can do nowadays. You, you can actually make your own book that looks and feels like a real book. Like this feels like a real thing, um, as far as I can tell anyway. It's even got a barcode on it. That, that's how you know it's, it's gotta be real, right? Um, look, oh, Katie's got one too. Um, and actually part of the reason we did that, Kaisa, is with this book, For In Feather Stand Together, all of the um, sales that we make when somebody buys the book, we actually give all of that money away. So we give all the money to groups that helped us in the process. Center for Biological Diversity, International Indigenous Youth Council, and the Sunrise Movement, which is a, a movement of young activists who are trying to work against climate change. That would be something that we wouldn't have been able to do with a traditional publisher, right? A traditional publisher, it's like maybe they give like some, like 1%, you know, of, of proceeds. Um, but we wanted to have that flexibility to just like let it really flow back to those groups. Um, so yeah, that, it's, that was the choice that we made for this one. Um, and so I'm, as far as like other books go, there's, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can get books out nowadays. And I'm in talks with like an independent publisher to do some, some of like the poems that I shared with you guys. Um, and then there's one other publisher, I gotta like knock on wood furiously here, that is like supposed to get back to me in like the next week about another book that I wrote called My Zoo. That's all about emotions. Um, and that would be more like kind of maybe what you're thinking of Kaisa of like as like a traditional publisher um, where, yeah, you know, you'd like to see it in bookstores and all that good stuff. Does that answer your question? Thank you for answering. Absolutely. Thank you for that, that very astute question about publishing. Mm -hmm. Were there we other? have a question from Amy as well. Oh, um, yeah. Amy would like to know a little bit more about the illustrator because she really, really likes the art and so do I. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you all should check her out. Um, I will actually put a link in the chat so you can find out more about Eliza. So this is my friend, Eliza. Camille, thanks, by the way. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> um, this is my friend, Eliza. This is her website. Um, and yeah, she's awesome. Um, and Eliza, what uh, part of the reason that I wanted to work with her um, is she loves illustrating animals. Um, and this just felt like the like super ultimate opportunity to, to work on a book together that just featured like tons and tons of animals. Um, and she is a professional illustrator. She worked at an animation studio. Um, she actually does animation or like um, illustration for Facebook. Um, and yeah, she's just super amazing. Um, and she and I had previously worked on another book called Mother, What is the Moon? Um, so yeah, she's, she's somebody I feel really fortunate that I just happen to be friends with. Um, she was the director of arts and crafts at Camp Tawanga, which is a camp where we met. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions? And I also have thoughts and ideas or questions for you guys, but I wanna make sure I open up the floor to, to all of you. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, when you were uh, researching some more about climate change for the book, did you learn any um, like specific fact that you hadn't known before, something that was surprising to you? Hmm, something surprising about climate change. I'm trying to think. Sorry, that was a tough one out of. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Um, I guess what I, I hadn't realized previously, and this is something that came up when I was connecting with the International Indigenous Youth Council, is just like how there's, you know, there's a lot of places already where 
people are losing their land, their coastal land, um, right? Because the, the oceans are, are rising and we can't necessarily see it every day, but for certain communities that are like right next to the water and, and are lower lying, it's, it's already, you know, having a really serious impact. Um, and so I learned about a documentary of one such place in Alaska that was just documenting kind of the, the erosion of their coastal land. Um, and yeah, part of, you know, part of, I think, working together on climate change is, is highlighting stories, telling stories, right? Um, and I think there's so many different stories of how does it look and how does it impact us? And when we share those stories, we help people to understand and we help make connections so we can work together. Um, so yeah, that was definitely something that, that came up in the process of learning about the book. I was gonna throw out there, I mean, I wanna, I wanna hear more questions that, that you all have about like writing or about climate change. Um, but given that it's Earth Day, um, I'd like to just throw it out there to, to all of you. Um, you know, what, what are some things that, that you care about, you know, when it comes to taking care of the earth? Um, what are some things that, that you feel like you want to work with others on to, to take care of? I see, I see Camille's mouth moving, but I, I we can't hear. So I have, um, so I really do, um, I um, think it's important to recycle and like when, um, when you wash your hands or something, don't leave the water on, like you should, I mean, don't leave the water on when you're brushing your teeth either and maybe like five water saving showers and toilets and things like that. And also I have my own little club with my neighbor and my grandparents about actually it's called Planet Earth and it's about taking care of the earth and recycling and all that stuff. Camille, what I really love about what you just shared is you highlighted two really important things, right? One is like individual actions that we can take, right? Things like not leaving the water running, um, buying, you know, sort of faucets, et cetera, that reduce water consumption and energy usage, right? So there are individual actions we can take and that's super important. And I hope you feel like, you know, good when you do those things. Um, and the other thing you highlighted, right, is, is joining a group or making a group. And I think for me, right, like climate change sometimes can seem like this really big, all-encompassing issue, like, oh my gosh, it can be really overwhelming. And then what I always am so inspired by is when I see how many people care about it and how many people are already working on it. And I think, right, to, to try to tackle something as big as you know, some a climate of an entire planet, um, it, it's got to take groups. It's going to take lots and lots of people working together. So I love that you have a you know a group with your family and your community, and I would encourage you to keep connecting with other groups. Like there's that Sunrise Movement group that I mentioned. Um, I'm sure, like if you ask, there's probably people at school, you know, who also really care about the planet that maybe could join your Planet Earth group. Um, I just think it's really important to always think about like, what can I individually do, but also like, what are the groups that I can join and work together with others on? That's, that's awesome. What are other ideas or, or things that people care about that you want to like work on coming out of Earth Day to like take care of the planet and, and take action? Um, it's not exactly an answer to that question. That's okay. But, um, Ever since I've been reading many books like Harry Potter, I've been, I keep on having um, ideas on making my own books and I just don't know what to write. And lots of times I think like, oh, if, if I only had my own publisher. And when you talked about you can make your own book, that made me excited. Um, but how do you make um, a cover and stuff without there being a publisher? Mm, oh my gosh. That is such, again, I love the specificity of your question. 
Um, and there's like a couple of parts to it. There's sort of like, I hear you saying that you are inspired, but sometimes you don't know what to write. Um, and then you're asking like, how do I actually publish a book? Um, first of all, I just want you to know that as a writer, like you're not alone in feeling stuck sometimes like, oh, what do I write about? It's, it, it can be, I don't know, it can, it's one of the challenges I think all writers face. And I just want to encourage you. It's Kaisa, right? Is Yeah. I want to encourage you, like, sometimes you just got to start and remember that you don't always know exactly where you're going, right? Like, that's what happened with this book. I started with an idea and it was a penguin and a polar bear, right? And then I had to be open to change. Um, and so many things changed in the process, but right, you got to start somewhere, create something and then let it, let it grow, let it evolve. So that's one thing I want to shine back to you. I'm so excited to hear that you are a, a budding author yourself. <laughs> um, and, and secondly, if you want, you know, if you're looking for ideas, just throwing it out there, we're going to send you some fur and feather sequel templates. If you wanted to, you could come up I with- I would like, love one. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So we're going to send that to you. And if you want to come up with like what you think comes next in the story, that would be so cool. And it could be a story, it could be a poem, like whatever feels good to you. So that's one like definite idea. And then to answer your question about like, how do I make a book, et cetera, the shortest answer I can give you is that to make a book nowadays, like if you just want to print a book, um, there are various like sort of companies that you can work with to do it. And all you really need is what they call a PDF file. Do you know what a PDF is? No. It's, it's a specific type of computer file. And if you can create that file, I bet if you asked a parent or an adult, they could probably like help you type up some words and, and turn it into that, that special type of computer file. Um, if you have that, you can send that PDF file to specific places and they will basically print it for you. Um, and then your question about the cover, I didn't make this cover. Right, like um, my friend Eliza did. Um, and the companies who make these books, they're the ones who like actually make it sort of like fee look and feel like a cover. So all you have to send is the right file to them. Usually again, kind of this special PDF file. And you send one file that's a cover and one file that's like your words or like the inside of your book. And then they take those things and turn it into sort of either like this book, which is what they call a hard cover, right? It's it's a solid book or a soft cover book, which is, you know, more of soft cover. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Yep. And and happy to, if, if you want, happy to try to correspond afterwards, if you want to know like actually some of the places that you could do that, like places you could reach out to. Thank um, you for answering my question again. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Um, other thoughts or questions, um, either questions that you have for me or or other ideas, you know, for things that you want to do, ways that you want to take care of the earth looking ahead. One of the things that um, my family likes to do is to buy groceries that are local, like locally grown foods, or to try try to grow our own foods if possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, again, we don't think about it, right? But like, it's, it's the individual and it's the big, the system, right? And we can make individual choices about where our food comes from. And that's a huge part of hopefully shifting the system to make it more sustainable, less sort of, you know, climate changing, I guess you could say. Um, that's a great idea. I, I love that as an example of action. Other thoughts or questions are, and I also know like, you know, we can, we've got about 15 minutes, but we can also hang out for as much or as little as, as folks want. Um, I can also read another silly poem if people want. Do you guys want another silly poem? Yes, please. Okay, let me see one that, that works without pictures. I like this one. This is, this is one of my favorites. This is called Wishing Well. Here we go. Wishing well, oh wishing well, grant this wish of which I tell. 
Keep my sister far away. Keep my sister's claws at bay. Help me live a life that's free from my sister's tyranny. Just like that, I felt a change, something ticklish, warm and strange. Onions sprouted from my hair. Garlic filled my underwear. Truly, I began to reek. I was so mad I could not speak. Wishing well, oh, wishing well, I did not wish that I should smell. That is true, the well replied, yet what you wished I've not denied. And if you do not like your smell, perhaps you are not wishing well. Hmm? Yeah, wishing well, pretty fun. I almost laughed so hard I almost fell in my seat. Oh my gosh, I gotta, I gotta get these, gotta get these out there. I don't know. Um, I could maybe me I'm trying to think if there's maybe one, one more that'd be fun, and then I can let y'all go. Oh, my my daughter really likes this one. This, this is called Manners. It's called Manners. Thank you for indulging. I, I love reading these poems. Manners. Take good care you never slurp. Catch yourself before you burp. Mind your cues and mind your peas. Elbows off the table, please. Close your mouth each time you chew. These are just the things you do. Now excuse yourself. I need some space so I can slobber, chomp, slurp, burp, mm, stuff my face. Mm -hmm, right, all these, there's just little twists here and there at the end. Um, cool. I mean, I, I could go on that, but you know, I, <laughs> I want to respect everybody's time here. <laughs> um, any last closing thoughts, questions, or things that, that I can offer before we head out for the day? Julia asks, are you working on a book right now? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out these poems. Yeah, for sure. Um, my zoo is in the works. Um, my agent is shopping around something called Porcupine and Steve Love Balloons. Um, we'll see if that gets picked up by any major publishers. Um, and I did submit, I, I don't know if you guys saw, there was a really cool children's book competition. Camille and, and Kaisa, you, you should think about this. There's like places to submit your work if, if you ever want to get it out there and, and they give really cool prizes. Um, there was a really cool international children's book competition. I think it's called like the Ad Astra or Astra something competition. And I submitted a, a story called The Window Maker to that one. So we'll see if, if, that, uh, if that goes anywhere. But yes, uh, forever working on books. Um, I think I'm coming back to the poetry though. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting some good critical feedback here. And uh, maybe you should should revisit that. Camille, you have a question. Yeah, how do you how do how do I participate in the contest? Oh, the like book writing contest. Well, the book writing contest, the one that like, how do you participate in it? Yeah, what I would say is if you Google, you, you know what I mean by going online and searching mm -hmm. on Google. Yeah. Um, I, of course, you know that you're, you're like the generation that knows this stuff. Um, if you just look up. Um, children's book competitions, you probably will find a bunch of stuff um, that you can submit to. And, and maybe even if you search children's book competition for students, you might find ones that are like specifically for folks your age. Um, the one that I was talking about, I, I think they just closed submissions um, earlier, like maybe like a, a few days ago but I know there's always new stuff that's cropping up and I highly encourage you to check it out. It's like, it's also just a great way to motivate yourself as a writer. Thank you. Um, also, I hope you win. Oh my gosh. Well, if, if we do, maybe we can, it, we can come back and do another event together with the window maker. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. I'll probably come if I can see, if I can find the link or if I can like sign up. Sometimes it gets full, but if it's not full and I can come all the time. That's very sweet of you, Camille. No pressure at all. And honestly, I just want to give like a special shout out. You you stayed on uh, today longer than anybody else. And, and I really appreciated all your questions. Um, and, and yeah, thank you for just like, just connecting with you has really inspired me like hearing your thoughts about all the work you're doing to take care of the earth. And it sounds like you're also interested in writing and all that stuff. And that's just so cool. 
keep keep up the awesome stuff that you're doing, okay? Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Camille. All righty, y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. And yes, we will follow up with an email to everybody who RSVP to the program here with the um, uh, kindness challenge and the um, invitation to complete the sequel for Fur and Feather. Um, but also wanted to remind people that if you want to read Fur and Feather again, it's in the library. So you can check it out from the library. <laughs> so it's here. <laughs> Head, head on over to cccLIB.org to place a hold on a copy today. <laughs> Alrighty. Thank you so Thanks much, David. Much. This was so much fun. Great. Totally. Bye.